What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's the one and only James Williams, Dark Waters. Real quick, real quick advertisement. I need you guys to head on over to eerieexpeditions.com. I'll put the link down in the description for you, eerieexpeditions.com. You're going to want to put your email there so you can reserve a seat for what's coming down the pipeline. Live streaming investigations from some of the most wildest places, both known and unknown, eerieexpeditions.com. Come explore with us. Your heart, keep it in your pocket for safekeeping. Don't ever let nobody be the reason. You throw it out, you stop caring about it. Don't let your head get in the way. Can't be defined by your mistakes. You know you try and you try really hard. But sometimes you fall. You yeah, sometimes you fall. My whole life I've been petty I Picked up the trade as a kid You see growing up I was small And I got bullied But I was smarter So I would outthink the bullies Get them to fight each other And then sit back and watch I remember one of the kids that used to bully me Had an accident on his bike You see he and his friends Built a ramp and this fool decided to jump it and all of the kids were standing around watching him. He made an outfit with a cape and all. And understand, my generation is long before any of the safety equipment that the modern generation had. There were no safety helmets, no knee pads, no elbow pads, none of that. So he's there on his bike about 20 yards away from the ramp, and he's hesitating. Remember, this is the kid who used to bully me. So I start to cheer him on, you know, getting the other kids to cheer him on as well. Putting gas in his tank. Now, looking at the ramp, the angle, the support, it was way too high. Definitely, absolutely, no way in hell he was safely jumping this ramp. And sure enough, this fool takes off riding full speed, hits that ramp, the bike shoots straight up in the air, flies from under his legs. He falls from eight feet in the air, slamming, landing on the back of his head. Now he's on the ground bleeding and screaming. All of his friends take off running and leave him. And I'm the only one standing there. He's saying, help me, help me, please help me. Remember, I told you that I was petty. So I reach out my hand pretending like I'm going to pick him up. And when he reaches for my help, I jerk away and tell him, listen, you should have thought about all this before you decided to bully me. Now, a few days later, I see him at school. His head is swollen. He's got stitches. He's angry because I didn't help him. And remember, he's bigger than me. So that day, he whooped my and I didn't see it as a problem. Yeah, he was punching on me. I blocked a few of them, curled up into a ball. But at the end of the day, his head was cracked open, and all I had was a few minor bruises. Anyway, I was 18 when I had my dog man encounter. I'm on my way home from school. Springtime. It was right before sundown. And the road I had to walk home had train tracks on the right and woods on the left. That evening, a train had stopped on the tracks loaded with these gigantic logs. I remember for the first time feeling like there was no escape as I walked down this roadway. And I don't want to confuse you, there was no reason for me to feel scared at the moment. It just dawned on me that if someone came speeding down that roadway, my only option was to run off into these deep woods or to try and climb up a train cart full of logs. Anyway, I'm walking along, right, when I suddenly get the feeling that I'm being watched. Then I hear this quick scratching sound like something climbing on top of those logs. And this werewolf literally comes flying down onto the road, looks at me as it's landing, and I'm terrified, standing there frozen in place. It squares up to me, stretching out his chest, his arms wide open. Look at me like, boy, if you don't get away from me, I'm going to kill you. Listen to me, everything inside of me wanted to run. But I knew growing up in that area that you never, ever run from a predator. And all I could think to do was to bow. So I bowed my head in submission. And it slowly walked away. Now, fast forward, I get home, tell my mom what happened. She thinks I'm crazy. I try to tell my dad, but he's watching a football game. So I go to bed with no dinner, scared out of my mind. Two days later, I'm walking down the same road. Keep in mind, this time there's no train, but I'm terrified. And I hear this truck coming up behind me. Looking over my shoulder, it's my sworn nemesis. The kid who cracked his head like an eggshell. 
he has this Ford pickup truck full of people and as they pass by they throw small rocks at me cursing me out calling me a wimp he's hanging out of the driver's side laughing calling me a loser his girlfriend is in the passenger seat egging him on now once they get past me I grab the biggest rock I could find and chuck it at his truck now I threw it not thinking that I was actually going to hit someone more as a way of making myself feel better about the situation but I ended up hitting one of the boys riding in the bed of his truck now they stop put the truck in reverse and head back my way so I take off into those woods running my tail off jumping over down trees tripping falling and I can hear them running behind me following me through the woods screaming we're gonna beat your when we catch you now understand I was taught that the shortest distance between two spaces is a straight line so in the woods I started running zigzags just random zigzag patterns hoping that they wouldn't catch me and it was doing one of these zags that I noticed the claw marks on the tree these huge long claw marks and instantly I stopped because now I'm remembering what I saw going into these woods I have a decision to make so I'm saying to myself do I take this whooping or do I keep running into these woods and possibly run into that creature that I saw on the road I tell myself no 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 we're not going any further we're just gonna have to take this beating so now I've turned around and I'm making a beeline straight for their direction. My plan was to scream and just keep running past them. Well, that plan didn't work because I get tackled by the same guy that I hit with the rock in the bed of the truck. Now I'm being held down while he's screaming for the others to come over in his direction. Looking at me, he says, boy, you got to be stupid. You ran straight into me. What the hell is wrong with you? You know we about to beat your ass. So I try to tell him, there's something in these woods worse than you think. And I believe that we're in its house, so we need to go. But he punches me in the face, laughing at me and calls for the others to come over. When the rest of them arrive, he says, this limp dick bastard right here believes there's something in these woods. Now, imagine a scene. I'm laying on the ground. He's got me pinned down. They have me circled like hyenas and they're laughing at me understand I'm there pleading with them saying listen I know we don't like each other I know y'all gonna whoop my ass. that's fine but whatever you do please let's get out of these woods and get back to the road and no just like a pack of rabbit hyenas they're just laughing at me. so I'm squirming on the ground break loose try to get away only to be kicked in the head now I'm dazed got white spots in my vision and they think it's funny until they hear the growl and I know for a fact they heard that growl because I heard it and they started to curse and swear saying what the F is that so now all of their attention turns from me into the woods and to be clear with you we were deep into these woods I ran at least 400 to 450 yards before I saw those claw marks and decided to turn around and run back in that direction and these woods themselves if you keep going further back they connect to this ridge line that goes up and down towards a river on the far end close to that ridge is where the logging operation was going on now back on my feet I step away getting out of the circle they had me in and say look man for real let's go we can sort all this out another day I'm scared let's go now pause right here in the story was I scared absolutely no doubt about it but it was one thing I knew one thing I knew for sure about my bully and I knew him better than he knew himself was the fact that he could not stand being afraid and he couldn't stand the fact that anybody around him would think that there was something that he was afraid of so when I said that I was scared deep down inside I knew I knew that that would push him to go deeper move further into those same woods and exactly as I predicted he did it now him and his crew have completely turned their attention away from me and now they're moving deeper into the woods trying to figure out what made the growl stepping further away from them I said listen I wouldn't do that if I was you but nope they're not listening so now I'm putting more space between me and them 50 yards 60 yards the back over there by that tree with the claw marks on it talking 
and I'm steady backing away. When out of the corner of my eye, I see that same werewolf thing down on all fours. It's circling around them to get behind them. And I'm like, oh, it takes this quick glance at me, but keeps moving closer and closer to them, low to the ground, almost like it's crawling, head swaying back and forth, left to right. Now I'm angling myself 45 degrees away from everything. I want to turn and run, but it's too soon. So I slowly back away till I'm damn near 100, 120 yards away from them. And you can barely see bodies through this thick brush and trees. Then I turn and run, hauling back to that roadway, pick up my school bag. And as I'm standing there catching my breath, I hear screaming. Even from that distance, as deep as they were into those woods, you can tell whatever the hell was happening wasn't good at all. So I run as fast as I can all the way home, get inside, go straight to my room. Six hours later, the sheriff is at our front door. My parents are pissed and he's asking me questions about what happened in the woods. So I tell him the exact story. I'm walking down the roadway. They pull up, throwing rocks and cursing at me. I grab a rock, throw it at them, run into the woods. They chase me into the woods. I see these giant claw marks on the trees. They surround me, beat me up. Then something growls. I take off running, get back to the road, get my school bag. I hear them screaming like something is murdering them, and I run home. So now the sheriff is pissed, asking me why I didn't call and tell him what was going on and try and get the kids some help. And I tell him, listen, it's none of my business what happened to them because had the shoe been on the other foot, I promise you, these kids would have done nothing to help me. Angrily, the sheriff tells me that if there's any criminal charges that he can press against me, he will, and demands that I come with him down to the station and file a report as to what happened. So my dad and I get in the car, follow him back to the police station, and that ride to the police station is a whole nother story because my father is pissed off. He tells me that I embarrassed him because the sheriff came to his door asking questions about an incident that he knew nothing about. And I try to remind him I had just tried to explain that whole situation to them a few days before when I came home scared out of my mind and neither him nor my mother believed me. So there was no reason for me to tell him anything else because he didn't believe me the very first time. And there was no reason for me to call the sheriff and tell the sheriff that a werewolf had attacked kids in the woods because he would have thought that it was a prank call. The only logical outcome was to let it play out and if the sheriff came, explain all of it to him then because now he would have evidence of the situation. Keep in mind, I got my level of intelligence and logic from my mother and not my father. One of the many things that my father resented about having me as a son. Anyway, now we get to the police station, hop out, follow the sheriff inside, and when we walk into the station, guess who's sitting in the lobby? Mr. Egghead, my nemesis. And you can tell looking at him that whatever happened in those woods, oh boy, it had to be bad. Moments later, the sheriff, my father, go into the office to talk in private. And I sit down right next to him. And I say, man, are you okay? But he's gone. I mean, space cadet gone. This blank stare in his eyes. And that's when he tells me what happened. He starts by saying, you know, this is all my fault. Had I just left you alone, drove past you, None of this wouldn't have happened. We would have never been in those woods. She would never be missing. He would never be hurt. Nothing would have happened. Now get this. After I backed away from them, they were all standing there, staring at the claw marks on the trees, making fun of it, trying to figure out what it was. And he says the next thing he knew, his friend Eddie. Now pause. Eddie was the guy I hit with the rock. Eddie was the guy who tackled me and punched me in the face. That's Eddie. The next thing he knew, Eddie was flying through the air, and a giant wolf was biting his arm, trying to pull him off into the woods. He takes this long, awkward pause and says, blood, man, blood was everywhere, man. He says that's when he took his knife out, ran over, and tried to stab it. But the wolf let Eddie go and then stood up on two legs. Now, according to him, 
from that moment on, he just remembers bits and pieces of what happened. Taking off his shirt, wrapping it around Eddie's arm, getting up only to see that everyone was gone. Now, according to him, from that point on, he just remembers bits and pieces of what happened next. Taking off his shirt and wrapping it around Eddie's arm. Then getting him up and trying to get him back to the road only to see that everyone else is gone and hear his girlfriend screaming in the distance. Him running full speed in the direction of the screams and never finding her. Honestly, for the first time ever, I felt sorry for him because he was having a full mental breakdown saying, had I just left you alone, man, had I just left you alone and been nice to you, none of this would ever happen. It's all my fault. All I had to do was just be nice. It was right then and there in that moment that I noticed the blood all over his shoes, all over the lower parts of his jeans. But honestly, what do you tell a person in a situation like that? A few minutes later, I'm called into the sheriff's office. He's sitting behind his desk. My dad is sitting on the other side, and I sit down next to my father, and he asks me if I want to press charges for being kicked in the head. Now, my father presumes to speak for me and says, no, Sheriff, we don't want to press charges. We want to do everything we can do to get out here and try and find this missing girl. But I interject, and I tell him, yes, I do want to press charges. Now, the sheriff is looking at me like, what the f is wrong with you? And I repeat it. Yes, I do want to press charges. They chased me down into those woods, put my life in danger. He kicked me in the head, and they all admitted it to you. I want to press charges. That's when the sheriff puts down his pen and says, Son, that boy who kicked you in the head is two towns over in the hospital. He's probably going to lose his arm. Don't you think that losing an arm is a big enough price to pay? And I tell him no. They've been harassing me and bullying me my entire life. I'm pressing charges. That's when my father looks at me like he's disappointed, gets up, and walks out. And when it's time to leave, I go outside and realize that he's left without me. So I turn and go back inside and ask the sheriff for a ride home. He's pissed and says all his deputies are out looking for the girl. Now I have to walk back home. It's 10 p.m. and I gotta walk down that same damn road. Was I scared? Absolutely, scared out of my freaking mind. But I walked it. And when I get home, my dad is sitting on the sofa. He's like, I figure since you a man now, and you know it all, you can find your own way home. Listen, I knew he was trying to get a rise out of me. But I also knew that being 18 years old, it was my decision to make. So I didn't respond. I just went upstairs to my room. Days went by. I mean, five, six days. And there was no sign of her. Listen, the school was in an uproar. There were rumors that she was raped and murdered. It was getting all the way out of hand. But by the time graduation rolled around, she was declared officially missing. And people seemed to forget about the whole situation. But I was never able to forget about it because my father stopped taking me places. I had to constantly walk down that same road to and from school every day and I want to be clear with you I never saw it again after that but every now and then I would get that feeling that I was being watched and when I felt that way I showed respect to this thing I would turn to the wood lines bow my head and say listen it's just me I'm on my way home when I graduated I left that town and my mother and I still speak but my father and I are estranged. According to him, I'm to blame for what happened to those kids. But the truth is, but the truth is, I was a trapped baby. My mother got pregnant before they were married, trapping him in the relationship. By her being pregnant, that forced them to get married because in those days, that's just what people did. My father resented me. To him, I symbolized nothing more than one giant mistake in his life. And then the fact that I took the intelligence traits from my mother as opposed to the athletic traits from him really made the situation worse. Now, that was my dog man encounter and truthfully, it was my life story. Today I have my own family and my son knows he's loved and so do his siblings. As for my nemesis, 